Aloha kako. My name is Arnie Saiki, and I want to introduce you to this whiteboard presentation on a regional ecological economic accounting scheme called Intemerate Accounts. In part, this is a collective project by a working group on data, statistics, and valuation, which includes the participation of some folk from the Pacific as well as the Caribbean and Africa. National accounts are generally measured through GDP or gross domestic product, but that has not always been the case. For example, the Soviet Union accounted for their national economy on the material product system or MPS. The United States up until 1991 followed the National Income and Product Account or NEPA, and recently NEPA and the UN system of national accounts have been harmonizing closer to U.S. aggregates rather than the U.S. moving closer to the U.N., but that's a much longer story. Um, intemerate accounts should not be seen as a replacement for GDP, but rather as a side table. Um, intemerate means inviolate, pure, undefiled, and I think it's an appropriate way to describe ecological accounting. National accounts are managed at the UN level by the UN Statistical Division. Um, GDP, as was conceived, measures national income by aggregating data indicators measuring consumption, investment, government spending on goods and services, and these Government spendings include exports of goods and services and imports of goods and services. GDP was originally developed by Simon Kuznet in 1934, and it was only in the 1950s that GDP replaced gross national product or GNP to be the standard economic indicator to all of the advanced OECD economies and is currently the standard used to measure the values of national economies. Um, by and large, GDP, as it is currently measured, does not adequately value biodiversity and its impacts. Consumption remains heavily overweighted, and GDP generally excludes the priorities of developing countries as well as environmental sustainability. But as I hope to show in this whiteboard, alternatives are possible. Um, not only are they possible, but they should be mandated um, because I think of no better way to challenge climate change than by the ACP countries adopting an accounting side table that accounts for their regional, cultural, and ecological priorities. Here is the list of variables that I will be using to describe intemerate accounts. This is the monetary factor, which is the sum value of this accounting framework. Note that this is a regional accounting factor rather than a national accounting factor. V is the value of ecological assets. R is our regional accounts. W are the well-being indicators. Z is our um, real nominal GDP. Q is our equalization factor. K is the impact factor. N is the intemerate offsets. C is the COT, CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere. And P is population. I'll keep these 10 variables on the screen as a reference. So this is the actual equation. I will return to this later, but this way you can see how these variables all interrelate to each other. Expressing the monetary factor is a straightforward linear e equation. Um, M equals R plus V. R is the variable for our regional accounts and V represents the value 
of our ecological assets. Expressing our regional accounts includes the variables W for well-being and Z, our regional GDP. The P that follows Z stands for Pacific. The GDP of the Pacific collectively is about $33.4 billion according to World Bank figures. This includes not only small Pacific Island states and territories, but also Papua New Guinea. This does not include Australia or New Zealand, um, Australia who is part of the OECD. W or well-being needs methodology, but following the statistical information in the Melanesian well-being indicators suggests that perhaps an average percent of some of the indicators that we might use is around 60% um, or 0.6% or 0 0.6 um, when we convert that. Um, when we multiply well-being with GDP, we get $20.4 billion. While this is a decrease of GDP and may seem counterintuitive to our objective, um, the point of this reduction is to ultimately increase well-being in the region. Well-being modulates our GDP. That also means that if the well-being indicator is at 100%, then the GDP value is preserved or if the well-being indicators are at 50%, then GDP is halved. Now let me express V, or the value of our ecological assets. V equals Q times K. Q equals equalization, which is GDP overpopulation, or a kind of modified GDP per capita. K is the impact factor, which is the multiplier of CO2 and the intemerate offsets, which I will later describe. Here I am expressing Q, or the equalization factor. Simply, it is GDP divided by population. In this work, I am rounding out nominal GDP according to the latest World Bank measurements with population, um, also using World Bank data when available. Here I am writing GDP for the Pacific, for the Caribbean, for Africa, for the high 18 OECD countries, and the total GDP for the ACP countries. I'm including a plus sign following the ACP to include other countries excluded from the ACP that also face similar fragility factors. Again, the GDP for the Pacific is about $33.4 billion. For the Caribbean, it's $250 billion. Africa is $1.6 trillion. The high 18 OECD countries is about $43.4 trillion. And then P for population. The Pacific is about 11.5 million people. The Caribbean is about 40.1 million. And in Africa, the population is about 1.3 billion. For the high 18, the population is 912 million. The total for the ACP countries are about 1.95 trillion. And the total population for the ACP countries is about 1.11 billion. As we do a straight per capita calculation, the Pacific is $16,100. The Caribbean is $17,232, while Africa is $1,720. The high 18 OECD countries are $47,588. The per capita average of the ACP countries is $1,758. In percentage terms for the ACP, the Pacific is 1.15%, the Caribbean is 3.6%, and Africa is 95.35%. Now here's the equalization. 
when we take the sum of the GDP per capita of the high 18 OECD countries, which is again $43.4 trillion, and divide that by the ACP population of 1.11 billion, the GDP per capita equalized against the high 18 countries is $39,002. When we multiply that with the Pacific, which has a population of 11.5 million, or as a percentage of the ACP, the equalization for the Pacific is $448.5 billion. Equalization simply means placing the three developing regions on equitable terms with the high 18 economies. Look at the difference in population. The ACP have 1.11 billion people and the high 18 have 912 million, a sum difference of about 200 million. Yet, there is a 2,218% difference in how we account for our population in terms of GDP. In our global fight against climate change, equalization is not a lot to ask considering our colonial and post-colonial histories, especially when we're fighting for our survival. The next variable in determining the value of our ecological assets is K, or the impact factor, where V equals Q times K. K equals C times N1 times N2 times N3, and so on. The subscript I that you see following the N is uh, just a counter. Here, we're going to determine the value of C, or the carbon factor. So in 1987, carbon in our atmosphere was equal to 350 parts per million. The overabundance of carbon in our atmosphere is what scientists have identified as being one of the leading sources of climate change. The global initiative to implement green environmental economic accounting emerged at that time. But with each year, we have seen a further undermining of actionable climate priorities. From the 1987 meeting known as the Brundtland Commission to the Kyoto Protocols to the Rio Plus 20 Summit in 2012 and the Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2015, we have continually seen the efforts by the advanced economies to underwrite good climate policy with initiatives that would mainly seek to benefit the corporate privatization agenda. From the time that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992 to the United States rejection of the Kyoto Protocol in 1998, the UN sought to create a timetable to reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere, and it was generally understood that industrial outputs and consumer activity would lead to greenhouse gas increases, threatening the biodiversity of our planet. At the time of the Kyoto meetings, carbon parts per million in the atmosphere measured 359 parts per million, again with 350 being a safe level. Uh, in 2014, CO2 parts per million picked up to about 400. Presently, the average CO2 level is 412 parts per million. So what the carbon factor expresses um, begins in 1987, which is where we established the 350 parts per million baseline. So with this table, the x-axis is a measure of carbon parts per million in the atmosphere, and the y-axis is the year. Following the y-axis, we will likely see CO2 rising above the 412 mark, which is current, and in time we will likely see a reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere, but probably not as fast as this line should probably be, should probably read 2050 or 2075. So where we are now is when we divide the dividend of 412 with the 350 divisor, our quotient is 1.1771. For future reference, if the carbon in our atmosphere goes up to 415 parts per million, the quotient is 1.1857. Again, the carbon if, if the carbon increases to 425, the quotient goes up to 
0.2143. So calculating impact factors at current levels, K equals 1.1857. And when we multiply that by the remaining factors of the intermittent offsets, our current equation Q would equal 448.5 billion. And when you multiply that with the 1.118, the value of our ecological assets is now at 528 billion. Now, when we include our intermittent offsets, it is um, measured similarly to the carbon baselines in that what N measures are the offsets from what we attribute as being a kind of zero baseline. Now, what is needed is data. We need data for ocean acidification, sea level rise, coral bleaching, coastal vegetation, the freshwater table, flora and fauna biodiversity, erosion, radiation, pollution, and other extreme events like an oil spill. So working on the equation, again, the subscript I is the counter. We have N1 times N2 times N3, so forth and so on. While much of this data is housed in a variety of institutions like SPC, SPREP, ANU, UNSCAP, USP, NOAA, and so on, we would need to implement a regional methodology that can integrate this data and value it according to endogenous non-market values. The accounting of the intermittent baseline could be measured through standard statistical input-output tables with the sum variance for the indicators recorded as multipliers of n. Although different, it is similar to the function of averaging the mean in a standard deviation equation. Additionally, this data should be owned by the community and assessed through an auditing process. What we need is that capacity to organize our data, develop the methodology, and establish the proper auditing protocols. This is what we seek to be underwritten either by states, investors, or regional institutions. And we envision a variety of ways this can be funded, but none more important than with the cooperation of traditional and customary peoples and principles. So for example, looking at the research and monitoring map on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the, on NOAA's website, we can view the mooring data for ocean acidification. While the values of these moorings contain some inconsistent fluctuation, there is also a recognizable pattern of consistency. Quality control cites each data entry as being affected by bad sea weather, questionable seawater, bad air measurements, and the like. But nevertheless, the data is relatively consistent, and changes to the average yearly values provide a measurable difference that can be applied to the intemerate baseline. The average percentage change of each mooring over one year, for example, is about 1.0359, and that is typical year after year from 2009 to 2018. We can also use intermarket accounts to value the impacts of the recent oil spill in the Solomon Islands. Using this data, we could measure the offsets from the spill, and in the context of this equation, the ecological impact would fall to the extreme end of the curve, providing a much larger value of 3. While it would be in the best interest to clean the oil spill, not doing so would inflate those numbers. And while it may seem counterintuitive to raise the monetary value of one's national account by allowing it to degrade as the ecological value decreases 
there would be greater access of funds for the community to restore the ecological biodiversity. This is where an accounting framework would require an auditing and regulatory, and regulatory stewardship council and where we could really begin to see how the data is an extremely valuable asset. So once again, returning to the equation, we have the monetary factor, which equals well-being as it modulates GDP, and that is added to the equalization factor, multiplied by the impact factors of CO2 and the intemerate offset. Now what these values all represent is the value of our ecological data. Rather than trying to assign value to our ecological data to the price of carbon in carbon markets, for example, we're pegging the value of our ecological data towards restoring it. That is the purpose of utilizing the intemerate baseline. By raising our regional accounts, we will be able to move away from boomerang aid schemes that have done little for the security or advancement of a region, and we will instead access the kind of funds that will allow us to build, create, invent, utilize, profit from our own technologies um, for the purpose of staying in our island homes. I want to express a uh, thank you to the Pacific Island Forum, the Pacific Conference of Churches, Pacific Theological College, USP Oceania Center, um, One and New Action Alliance, and of course, those in the working group for data statistics and valuation. Aloha Aina.